Eric received his bachelor's degree in sociology from Illinois Benedictine College. I won't give the year. <laughs> they have the year. A while back. A, A while, while ago. And both his <laughs> master's and PhD from the University of Chicago. His, in, his research primarily focuses on instructional improvement, especially in urban public schools. And his early work documented the difficulty low-income and minority students in urban schools have in negotiating transitions from elementary to high school and from high school to post-secondary education. His current uh, research has two related strands of inquiry. One, the investigation of factors that focus, uh, that support instructional improvement, and two, the use of survey methods for studying instructional improvement. Um, so now I think I will turn this over to Eric and let him share his work with us on, it says, leadership practices that support instructional change <laughs> and improve <laughs> Well, thanks, Hank, and thanks, Julie, and, and thanks, everybody, for coming out on this, on this cold day. And, um, and boy, what a, <clears throat> let me just acknowledge what a, what a great honor and privilege it is to have gotten tenure at such a great university and a great school of education, a great department, and, <coughs> and thank you. <laughs> um, so, yes, I'd, 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 I want to talk a little bit about, um, I want to share a perspective on leadership um, about how leadership can, uh, can bring about and facilitate improvements in instructional practices uh, in schools and widespread instructional practices and also student achievement. Um, in some ways, it's what our interventions are. It's the two kind of objects that our uh, interventions in schools are often pointed at. And so um, uh, it, it, it's my focus for today. And, and, and um, the perspective that I'm going to present is, is grounded in, in a body of work that, uh, in, in a large-scale longitudinal study that I'll say a little bit more about uh, in a minute that, that studied comprehensive school reform. So this is a, a particular view of, uh, of how leadership can improve teaching, uh, can teaching and learning. It's, it's, it's one potential path, I think, is, is how we might look at it. And so I'm going to try out um, a new pre presentation approach uh, <coughs> today. Um, I, I've heard that, that sometimes it helps um, if, uh, if, if, if uh, you kind of play, pay closer attention to trying to make a connection to something um, or, or that your audience will pay closer attention if you can make a kind of a subtle connection to something that perhaps that they're, uh, uh, that they're interested in, something that they're... Uh, um, in, engaged in. So I thought, <laughs> this is uh, <laughs> this is my subtle approach to trying to draw you all in and and, and, and attract some interest too. <laughs> As I said, my talk is focused on leadership practices that support <laughs> instructional change and improve student learning. <laughs> Um, at the outset, I want to um, uh, make clear that, that the uh, results that I'm going to present were absolutely a group effort. I worked as part of a large uh, team of researchers, uh, primarily based at the University of Michigan, but now kind of spread all over the country. Um, this, the study that I'm going to talk about is the study of instructional improvement. Uh, data were collected uh, over a four-year period. Um, uh, but really, the study took uh, well over 12 years to complete. I went there as a postdoc in 1997, uh, right after uh, defending my dissertation, and um, was there up until 2004 when I came here. And um, the project, uh, just for all intents and purposes, shut down um, about a year ago. Um, the, the, the fruits of our labor can be found uh, at this website here, and um, that website contains all of the data, the instruments that produce the data, uh, summaries of uh, some of the results that have been published, and uh, those are now all um, have been made available to the public. Uh, so I'd, I'd like to acknowledge a few members of this, uh, uh, of this team that uh, uh, that I collaborated with on this work. Uh, Carol Barnes, 
who's uh, at Michigan, Richard Carenti, who's now at the University of Pittsburgh, Siang Wan, Han, who is uh, here in sociology, and uh, Robert Miller, who's at Texas A&M, and Brian Rowan, who is at the University of Michigan. So um, this, is, this is the research that kind of forms the basis for what I'm gonna be talking about. And um, while I am uh, co-author on many of the uh, papers, I'm also gonna be reporting on uh, a, a number of other papers um, uh, that have been produced by my colleagues. So just a little bit of background on, um, on the study and the study's design, um, just to help set some of the research that I'm gonna talk about in context. Uh, the study of instructional improvement was a quasi-experiment uh, of three comprehensive school reforms, the Accelerated Schools Project, America's Choice, and Success for All. These programs, um, as we'll see in a minute, were purposely chosen because their designs were really markedly different. They each had a different kind of design focus and they both, or they each rather, um, intervened on instruction in, in, in kind of markedly different ways. They were purposefully chosen because of that, um, because they offered f what we thought was fairly unique insights into the instructional change process. Um, so there's a, qu a quantitative component and a qualitative component of, of the study. Uh, the quantitative component, we were in about 114 schools nationwide. Um, the, the, the vast majority of those schools were uh, serving primarily disadvantaged uh, student populations. Um, they were all elementary schools. Uh, and uh, so we studied um, three kind of main domains uh, in the study. First, we, uh, the design is really kind of a student-centric design. Students were at the heart of the study, and, we, and so we studied uh, student achievement growth over uh, a three-year period for two different cohorts of students, a cohort of kindergarten students, and a, um, we followed them from K to two, and a, and a cohort of third grade students who we followed from three to five. Um, we also looked at and, and measured the instructional experiences of these students in a variety of ways. And then we also um, measured program implementation and school processes. So kind of uh, leadership and other school processes, um, mostly through surveys. Uh, there was also a qualitative component. If you can imagine, we actually coaxed 12 of these 114 schools to not only do all of this stuff, which included uh, filling out, uh, uh, l having, asking teachers to fill out logs on a daily basis. So we, we, we coaxed schools into not only doing all this stuff, but also allowing us to come in at multiple points in time. I think at least uh, two, perhaps th three of the study years, we went in there and did case studies in a subset of these 12 schools. So for these 12 schools, um, we had not only the, um, the quantitative data, but we also had interviews with teachers, interviews with school leaders, and um, interviews with district staff to kind of paint um, a little picture of the context. So just also by way of background, um, this is how, uh, you know, kind of at the outset of the study, this is how folks thought that these comprehensive refor pro reform programs were supposed to work. This is kind of the logic model behind the program, the, the logic is that you have these external uh, change agents, that is the comprehensive reform programs themselves, um, and they are largely uh, designers. They design, uh, they design uh, curriculum materials in some cases, they design classroom practices, and um, they design school policies. And, um, and then to uh, greater and lesser degrees, depending on the intervention, they, they take what they've designed and provide uh, assistance to schools. And, and, and this, is, this assistance, as you might imagine, is more or less, um, more or less in intensive, more or less direct, more or, le more or less um, uh, kind of prolonged over, over periods of time. So you have a program. Um, the program is introduced into schools, it's implemented. Just the act of implementation introduces new resources uh, into schools. And um, 
for purposes of what I'm talking about today, one of the most important uh, resources that are uh, introduced are, are uh, teacher leadership resources. And these are very often um, not necessarily new hires, but um, as we'll see in a minute, these are uh, introducing kind of a new set of uh, practices and people are doing things differently than, than what they did before. Um, and of course, if the designed curriculum and policies and practices are implemented, um, then that, um, uh, that can lead to change, changes in all of those things. The theory is, of course, that uh, if all of these things kind of fall into place, if this designed uh, uh, program is implemented properly, the, the theory is that that leads to um, improved student, student learning ultimately. So that's, that's the theory. Um, I want to say a little bit uh, about kind of the perspective on leadership we took. And, and boy, it's timely that Rich came here because we drew heavily on, <laughs> on, on Rich and company's work from Northwestern and, and, and how we looked at leadership. We took a distributed perspective on leadership. And, we, and, and when I say that, what, it, what I mean is that we, um, uh, we anticipated that in our measurement. We, we uh, had some working hypotheses that um, leadership was in fact distributed and lo and behold, uh, we found that in fact was, that that's, that's the norm, that um, the, the single heroic principle is, is uh, you know, not surprising. Um, just is, is hard, to, if not impossible, to find out there. Um, so what we found is that uh, leadership is distributed both across um, people and across artifacts and tools. And um, so rather than the kind of single heroic um, principle, we found that by and large that uh, leadership was distributed across leadership teams. And we tried, um, excuse me, uh, one of the goals of the project was to really to try to describe how, in fact, leadership was dis distributed across teams. Um, as Rich's work and other tells us, it's not only distributed across um, people, but leadership is also distributed across artifacts and tools. And, um, what we found is that the things that were tended to be distributed were knowledge and responsibility or authority for doing things and action, kind of a shared a division of labor, um, if you will. Okay. So that was our take on, on leadership. So I wanted to um, uh, start off by just uh, sort of providing an overview, a rough overview of the results. And, and um, what I've done is put together uh, two school profiles. And uh, so these are synthetic profiles and that they've been uh, built from synthesizing um, the, the research, the, the reference list um, that I just uh, showed you a second ago. And um, so these are not case studies. And um, uh, but they're rather sort of profiles that kind of illustrate the main um, findings of the research. So one of these profiles illustrates the Accelerated Schools Project, this first one, and the other illustrates the uh, America's Choice Program. And um, as I mentioned uh, a bit ago, th these two, these programs really differed quite a bit in, in their design and what they uh, uh, what they encouraged folks um, uh, to, to do. And so the, the Accelerated Schools Project is, is um, distinctive in that it doesn't have a terribly explicit instructional focus. It, it communicates a concept called powerful learning, which is not concept, or not content specific rather. It doesn't focus in a particular subject area. Um, uh, it just, it sort of, it, it's, uh, it sort of describes in some sense kind of generic um, constructivist instructional principles that, uh, that schools are expected to um, kind of adopt and shape on their own. And in some sense it's the, 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 you might describe 
the logic model there is sort of let a thousand flowers bloom. That is, you sort of you sow the seeds of by giving general principles to schools, and it's expected that schools will self-actualize and sort of develop on their own. What it does focus on um, is that it it puts in place kind of organizational structures. It it uh, it calls for the development of these teacher teams called cadres and and um, and um, requires that that these teams meet periodically and it um, it requires the 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 appointment of um, instructional coaches um, but at its heart it doesn't have a very explicit uh, instructional focus so in this school in this illustrated school or in this uh, uh, achievement was was flat and um, again th these profiles have a basis in the larger results of the study which I'll which I'll go into in a little bit more detail in a second um, so instruction was flat in the school um, instruction was not systematically changed in the school and that's that's uh, also reflective of the larger finding with uh, associated with this program uh, in the larger study. So in terms of leadership, like a lot of accelerated schools, they named a coach, but that coach uh, didn't, the, the provided professional development, but that professional development wasn't specifically focused on changing instructional practices in a particular content area. It was focused more on these kind of general principles. Um, these cadres formed uh, in the schools, but, but meetings were infrequent. Um, the the principle in terms of in terms of principal leadership the principal was um, supportive but not terribly involved in kind of the day-to-day -day operations of, of, of this program and um, the other thing that characterized um, this school uh, is that uh, there was a little direction from the school district there was little guidance about how the program should be implemented and little support from the school district. And so, as I say, this, is, this, um, this profile is kind of illustrative of some of the themes that emerged in, um, in the research. So if we have kind of a picture of <coughs> this stagnant school in mind, that gives us kind of a contrasting point here for, um, for Compton, which is a profile of an improving school. So, um, Compton uh, illustrates a program called uh, America's Choice, which did have a very clear instructional focus. They had, um, they, their, their primary f focus when we studied them was to, uh, to provide intensive, uh, e explicit uh, uh, writing instruction and for, for students. And they looked at that not only as a skill in and of itself, but they looked, they viewed writing, excuse me, as a vehicle for increasing students' reading comprehension. Um, and so they had um, kind of a unique uh, uh, take on the role of writing and, and, and that, was, that was their primary emphasis. Um, in this school, reading achievement grew at a faster pace after the program had been implemented. So not just simply, reading achievement wasn't simply higher, but students' rate of growth increased after the program was increased, or, or after the program was adopted, rather. Um, in this school, there was widespread adoption of the program, or the, of the practices that um, were articulated by the program. The, the practices, unlike uh, the Accelerated Schools Project, in America's Choice, there were very clear blueprints for what teachers were expected to do in the school. Um, there were widespread, there was widespread adoption of those practices. Um, unlike the, the other school we just looked at in this school, uh, two instructional leaders were named. And um, both of those instructional leaders were experts in uh, literacy instruction, <coughs> which contrasts uh, with that earlier. Uh, case the principal in this case provided strategic support for the the uh, development of this program um, in terms of selecting teacher leaders uh, the principal had um, uh, played a significant role in finding teachers who had literacy 
uh, expertise, and um, and also uh, work to modify the school schedule to kind of support the kinds of ongoing um, embedded learning opportunities that were provided by the program. Um, and then finally, uh, this school differs from the other one in in the role that the district played. The district um, played a much more supportive uh, uh, played a much more supportive role in than the than the than the prior district. It, it uh, the district valued the program, was actually trying to implement it district wide, and provided direct support to the school uh, in support of that program. So this just gives you kind of a flavor of of some of the themes that emerged. Um, in the research. Now I want to go into a little bit more depth. Um, as you might have gathered, there, there are um, kind of three key themes that, that emerged. Um, one is the, uh, the importance of having kind of clearly defined outcomes or objectives to shoot for, and also blueprints for achieving those objectives. Two, is the importance of allocating specialized human resources, particularly teacher leaders, um, was, was found to be key in, kind of sh in, in shaping instructional change and in, in changes in student achievement. And then third is the importance of um, district lead leadership. So I wanna go into um, a bit more detail on each of these three things to, to put a little more flesh on the bones about how this actually played out in these schools. Um, so, First, in looking at uh, the value of, of, of uh, kind of a blueprint and, and, um, uh, and also having clearly defined outcomes. Um, the, of the three models we studied, as I've already sort of hinted at, uh, already of the two models we studied, the, or of the three models we studied rather, the two that had an explicit focus on instruction and had a, an, ex, an explicit blueprint for instruction, those are the two programs that had an effect on instruction and had an effect on achievement. The program that didn't have a clear, explicit focus on instruction had no discernible effect on instructional practices and no discernible effect on student achievement. So that was one of the, our big takeaways from, uh, from this study. Um, one thing that was, uh, we think, that was distinctive about these two programs is that they had, they provided both a target, an object, something, something to shoot for, and also a blueprint for achieving um, that target. And so what do these blueprints look like? Well, these, these blueprints really um, contained a lot of an intelligence and a lot of knowledge about <coughs> Uh, about instructional practices. In the case of Success for All, there was an early grades reading curriculum. So it literally uh, in, involved a curriculum and, uh, and then a clear blueprint for teachers about how to implement that curriculum, which, which implied um, you know, th particular theories of learning and particular theories of instruction, which you know, we may or may not agree with, but they had, there was a plan there, there was a blueprint. Um, and this, Similarly with America's Choice, there was, uh, there, uh, was uh, curricular materials and then there were um, blueprints for, for using those materials and, and, and clear blueprints for teaching. And so um, blueprints not just for teachers, right? The, we, we often think with programs like these that um, uh, that the teachers are the primary focus, but in, in fact, what we found is that uh, having these more explicit designs not only affected the, uh, the work of teachers, but they affected the work of the joint work of teachers and leaders. That is, they gave them something to focus on. Um, and in some cases, that was kind of a starting point that, that, um, that ended up being pretty substantially adapted, but it, it gave them, uh, uh, significant content to, to focus on. Um, it also potentially made um, the, the, uh, the work of leaders and teachers working together more efficient by not having to totally reinvent the wheel. And uh, as in some ways the, the, the design of the Accelerated Schools Project um, required. These, these models uh, that are based on the logic of kind of let a, let a thousand flowers bloom 
in a sense, require that. They, they put the onus of, of developing theory of learning and developing instructional materials on um, school staff. Not that that's necessarily a bad thing, but it just, um, it, it, it had clear implications for what we were able to uh, see in terms of instructional change and changes in student achievement. Um, and so you might think, and I, this is, uh, um, uh, you know, a point that, that might be uh, interesting to sort of pick up for discussion um, later is that, is that uh, one of the concerns raised particularly about programs like Success for All is that they're too prescriptive. They usurp professional autonomy. And um, what we found is that in America's Choice and Success for All, that these programs weren't necessarily um, implemented mindlessly. That, that in most cases, we actually saw that there was a lot of local uh, adaptation of the materials and, and of these blueprints. So a little bit more detail about um, kind of allocating, in some cases reallocating, uh, human resources to folk to provide um, instructional leadership through teacher leadership. Um, this was really kind of a fundamental uh, aspect of the design of these programs. They all, all three programs designed instructional leadership positions. They all required the, um, the adoption and the, uh, of, of teacher leadership positions. Um, but there were really significant differences in, in how they defined the roles for, for teacher leaders. Um, you know, in most cases, the roles were clearly specified, either through manuals or through professional development documents. Um, but the, the, all of these programs clearly relied on teacher leadership as a mechanism to deliver the program. They also sort of a basic purpose that these teacher leaders were serving was that this is how the program was going to be delivered uh, to teachers. Um, now, of course, delivery can vary. You can just, you know, you can just sort of lay it on people's doorstep and, or um, you, can, you can provide sort of sustained, ongoing, interactive, uh, in-context learning experiences um, for teachers. And um, and so again, two of the um, two of the three uh, comprehensive reform programs really provided those kinds of ongoing um, embedded learning experiences for for teachers. <coughs> and we found what we found is that um, when they had something to uh, to kind of collaborate about these designs with more explicit blueprints for instruction, that that really, that seemed to be sort of a leverage point um, for teacher leadership. Principles, it kind of an interesting role. So where, you know, you, you might ask, well, if, if you're sort of changing the leadership landscape in schools, where are principles in all this? And we found that, you know, in a fair number of cases, principles weren't terribly knowledgeable or involved in um, sort of the day-to-day -day operations of what was going on in these, in these programs. And in some cases, that didn't appear to be such a bad thing. Um, you know, these, um, it, a lot of these schools, like a lot of, uh, these, are, these are schools that are primar primarily located in, in urban areas. They're big schools. Um, and um, they're complex organizations. And so um, some of this sort of looked like a, possibly a sensible division of labor, you know, to us. That, that in, in fact, in some cases, by, by specializing, pro by providing specialized um, kind of teacher leadership, human resources in schools, that that um, might have freed the principals up to, to focus their attention on other things. What we've seen on district leadership, and this is, this is probably a part of the study that's um, um, more uh, slowly emerging than, than others. But um, what we've seen on district leadership is kind of interesting and potentially um, provocative. I gotta get you guys fired up somehow. <laughs> 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 um, but uh, <clears throat> centralization, that sounds like a bad word, doesn't it? That, uh, so uh, 
the, in terms of district leadership, there, the, a group of colleagues have looked at uh, what they call centralization and also jurisdictional leadership. And, and, and centralization um, refers to essentially how active districts are, how, how outgoing they are in providing direct support to schools uh, for school improvement in this case. And they use jurisdictional, um, this phrase jurisdictional to refer to um, the degree to which districts placed limits on choice of reforms. And um, they, they sp specifically use the term to uh, jurisdictional to, ref to refer to districts that um, placed, tended to place tighter limits on to constrain school cho uh, dist or schools' choices in choosing school improvement initiatives. So literally there are some uh, larger districts in our study that uh, said, uh, that presented the choice to schools, you have a menu choice here of two or three comprehensive school reform programs. There, at the time, I think there were something on the order of 60 or 70 of these things in play. You have a, a short menu choice of two or three of these things that you can choose from. And um, that had implications for the kinds of supports that the districts were able to um, uh, offer to schools. What they found was that um, in looking at the districts that um, our schools were located in, they found that, uh, that the centralized jurisdictional districts tended to provide more, co more coherent guidance for instructional improvement. That is constraining the choices to fewer, you know, having fewer choices, um, and also by ha having a more active district. The the result of that was that that schools in such districts got more direct support. Um, the districts more, were more likely to provide kind of models and examples of. Um, in in some cases, they were making connections, helping to connect schools within districts to one another. Um, to be able to see different models and examples and kind of leverage that. Um, those districts also, there also just seem to be sort of a, 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 in general, more support for um, school improvement efforts at the building uh, level. They, they allocated greater resources for schools in those kinds of districts. So what can we take away um, from all this? I guess one of the one of the ways that I tend to look at the study of instructional improvement is just sort of as a large scale existence proof. Um, these, as as some of you may know, these these comprehensive school reform programs have, in some ways, have sort of gone the way of the dodo. There used to be, um, there there used to be like a lot of federal initiatives. There used to be um, quite a bit of federal level support for these comprehensive reform programs. It doesn't exist anymore. It's not that schools are still implementing these things, but it's like a lot of uh, it's like a lot of reform efforts out there that um, are you know potentially going to fall in the trash heap of of many other reform efforts. And, and Larry Cuban can add it to his list of failed reforms when he when he updates his next uh, <laughs> updates his next book. Um, but in 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 some ways. Uh, you know, I think to me the our, the study provides, in a sense, an, an existence proof that you can change instruction on a large scale, and you can bring about changes in student achievement in these settings where educators often kind of throw up their hands. Um, we we worked in some of the um, in some of the toughest districts around the country, and the study was conducted rather in, in some of the toughest districts around the country, and we saw widespread uh, significant changes in, uh, in instructional practices in these schools. And we saw um, substantial effects on student achievement in two of the three uh, programs. So the key ingredients um, to that seem to be these well-articulated targets um, and uh, well-articulated blueprints for achieving the targets and this strategic distribution of, of, of human resources to teacher leadership positions, and this kind of distinctive district approach of constraining choices and providing direct um, support to, to buildings, to school buildings. Now, of course, you know, these, are, these um, results aren't 
uncontroversial, right? They do sort of their intention with a lot of the research of the 80s and 90s that, um, you know, that pushed for teacher autonomy and decentralization. And those were sort of the watchwords of the, the 80s and 90s. And, and, I, th and um, you know, I think that these, these, uh, these results are kind of intention with those. And um, certainly these results can be implemented in kind of um, mindless, prescriptive, automatic kinds of ways. Um, we found that uh, like a lot of the literature on policy implementation that suggests that any kind of, and that's in a sense how uh, our team came to view these comprehensive school reforms programs as, uh, as, as policies, as, as, as kind of representing what a policy might be, albeit a very comprehensive um, policy. But, um, uh, but we found that, that there was a, a tremendous amount of local adaptation, that these things were rarely, if ever, um, just adopted and implemented um, just as they were designed. And um, I don't know that that you know, completely uh, uh, you know, gets, gets rid of the concern um, of kind of centralization and, and, and usurping uh, professional autonomy. But, um, you know, I think that might be, in a sense, uh, a potential escape valve. So I'll stop there and see if you all have questions. See if I, if I stirred, stirred the pot at least a little bit with centralization. Yes, Ken, I, I, I figured Ken. <laughs> um, no, I think this is fascinating. I mean, it, um, the, the question I had, uh, I have an aside, which is that uh, uh, without that last statement, um, th we could return to bureaucratic top-down <laughs> implementation like they did in Chicago, LA, and, and New York mm -hmm. in the 70s and 80s. It didn't work. Um, but where is you know where is the symbolic side of leadership here? Or did they ever talk about uh, uh, the targets as values, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. or build a culture where? student learning was, was uh, an important part of mm -hmm. what was going on? Or did they just say, these are our targets, um, mm -hmm. we got to do them, just you know, you know, get your behind in gear? I think it varied a lot from setting to setting. <laughs> Certainly there were some contexts where, where these reforms were pushed very hard centrally and, and pushed down to the building level. But I think um, in a lot of cases we saw that um, that there was sort of a prolonged um, uh, adoption process where in some cases up to a year was taken where the schools uh, decided on which, which program to, to take on. And in most of these things, um, even the most prescriptive, most of these things um, involve votes where faculty have to vote on and it has to reach some threshold. And, uh, you know, percentage where, you know, a certain percentage of faculty has to vote to, to agree to accept a program before it can be adopted by the school and before the program will agree to work with the, work with the school. And I think what we saw is that in that process of uh, adoption and kind of researching where the schools were researching, which, how the program might fit with the existing culture and, and norms, that there were discussions like that. And, um, you know, I think um, to the extent that there were kind of ongoing discussions uh, like that, I think in some cases we saw that that um, that uh, by plunking a comprehensive reform program down in the middle of a school, that that provoked conversations like this after the fact. In some cases, it didn't. In some, you know, in in some cases, it was very top down. You know, this is the this is the plan, this is the program, and, and it will be implemented. But in other cases, it did seem to kind of provoke kind of a reflection, an organizational reflection. Um, Eric, I'm curious that um, in, when you listed the, the key ingredients, if I think I remember them all correctly, that professional learning was subsumed under a category of leadership. It wasn't a separate ingredient. That surprises me. Can you tell me a little bit about mm -hmm. that? Why mm -hmm. would it then collapse under that category? Yeah. Yeah, it's... Um, Part of it's definitional. We struggled with how to define uh, and whether these, um, these teacher leaders are in fact leaders as, as leaders are tra traditionally 
uh, conceived, the whole notion of, of followers becomes um, complex and problematic um, when you're talking about kind of a collegial interaction that's, that's where interaction between colleagues is supposed to promote professional learning in, in the workplace. And so it's, you know, it's not clear that leadership is a great, the way that it's traditionally conceived is, is, a, is a great uh, way of, of looking at that. But we, um, the, the, the way that we, we conceived of it is, 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 an, is an organizational function that, that we subsumed under leadership that, that, um, that it was something that sort of fell within the domain of a subset of uh, organizational actors that, that, that were providing um, leadership through their actions and so that that, uh, but it's, it, there's, there's certainly bleed over there, right? It's professional learning. So it's in, and uh, so there's of course the, um, the teacher side of, of, of things, which is maybe something else besides leadership, right? So. Yeah, okay. Hmm. Well, because it, there was a slide that um, suggested, well, what is distributed and was um, knowledge, responsibility, and actions, I think. Right. Yeah, mm -hmm. And so if, if those are the things, and that's kind of, um, what's that kind of the curriculum for learning, that there's this knowledge to be distributed across about the various programs and there's responsibility and awareness and then the actions that they take, so okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But it, it was, it was complex. <coughs> Thanks. Yeah, Alan. My question mm -hmm. follows on from Paul's, and uh, thank you very much for your uh, analysis and sharing with us of the relationship between distributed leadership on the one hand and the criterion that I heard the most about having to do with student learning for early elementary students. Now, I'm interested in the teacher part of this, and I'd like you to, I'd be interested in what more you could say about that because as I move from the elementary grades to secondary and to higher post-secondary education, mm -hmm. the relative autonomy of the teacher ends up by being a major factor you have to deal with. Right. Witness college professors and, and uh, how you yeah. think about reform uh, there. Yeah. And so uh, say, say a little bit more about how, what you can <laughs> conclude from your study about not the teacher leaders which are, who are part of distributed leadership, and that's a very important part of your findings, I think. But the other teachers, uh, and, and, and did you have data of any sort that would help you to understand their behavior, their practices, how they went about their teaching to, to either enhance or not student learning of those uh, early elementary uh, kids? Yeah. Uh, yep. and how they viewed what was happening to them, how they viewed this comprehensive reform and what the, the distributed leadership wanted them to do and how that related to how they thought about the content and the, the kids that they were dealing with and so on. What so If you were to provide a profile mm -hmm. of some of the teachers who were involved in that rather than the sort of leadership the leaders, yeah. and how it worked mm -hmm. organizationally, yeah. what sort of lessons would your study allow you to take away regarding the, the teacher view of what happened to them, what they did, what they tried to do, what helped and hindered and so on? Yeah, one of the things, and I think it's related to Paul's question, I think one of the, it's, 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 we're, it's in this area where um, the, the distinction between kind of leadership and leaders interacting with teachers and, and leaders, teachers that have been designated into leadership positions and distinguishing between that and what we might call collegial learning in the workplace. It's, I think that there, there's kind of a gray, um, gray area and they, a lot of overlap. But what, what, um, what we found is that, um, is that these, the, the, the ways in which teachers interacted with these leaders varied quite a bit, depending largely on the designs of these programs. There were some of these, or a couple of these programs that really, one in particular, this America's Choice program, really seemed to um, value professional autonomy a bit more than, than some of the others and create um, what, what I would characterize as sort of ongoing embedded learning opportunities for teachers, that, that they weren't just 
sort of structured, formal meetings where teachers kind of sat around a table like this and, 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 um, and took turns kind of yakking at each other. Rather, these were, um, these were interchanges that, that were, in some cases, took part inside teachers' classrooms, um, sometimes involved sort of one-on-one -on -one discussions with coaches. Um, and so what we found is that in, in cases like that where those, those interchanges were more significantly connected, were more significantly connected to what teachers were actually doing in the classroom and more connected to problems that teachers were actually trying to solve in their own classroom and were sustained over longer periods of time. They were focused on trying to help teachers solve problems that they were trying to solve in the classroom, that those, um, those kinds of interactions, those kinds of serial interactions were more likely to uh, lead to kind of deeper substantial changes in teacher practice. W one of the, whether it's, a, whether it's sort of a side um, benefit or sort of symptomatic of teachers more deeply engaging in this process, I looked in particular at the degree to which teachers were engaging what I call reflective practice and the degree to which teachers were kind of reflecting, stopping and, and, and really thinking about what they were doing and taking away from these interactions, um, uh, 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 not just simply uh, you know, taking something off the shelf and implementing, but rather stopping and reflecting on what they were doing, those kinds of, that reflective practice was more likely if these interchanges had the kind of character that I was just talking about, right? That where, where teachers were, um, where the interactions were more closely tied to um, what teachers were doing. One, one example, a uh, perhaps more concrete example of how that played out was the analysis of student work. The America's Choice Program, one of the ways, one of the vehicles that they used for these interactions between teachers was, t was for coaches and teachers to sit down and look at, at examples of student work and kind of jointly analyze students' work. In a sense, um, performing kind of a, a, a think aloud assessment task, right? Where you're kind of surfacing what it is that the student knows, what is the student struggling with. It sort of gets all that out in the open. And then you have kind of a critical friend there who can, can help you with um, kind of puzzling through that sort of thing. When, those, when, the, when the interactions between um, teachers and these teacher leaders focused more on those things as opposed to sort of, you know, the, the more common kind of sit and get and sitting around a table like this, then those were more likely to foster uh, reflection on one's practice. Would, would <coughs> any of the reports that you referred to that all been prepared or what could be extracted from that information allow uh, both developing exemplars that illustrate how teacher followers mm -hmm. perceive what was happening to them, mm -hmm. uh, how they interpreted what helped and what hindered those efforts and so mm -hmm. on. So in a sense, that's the good news. It could be emulated elsewhere, but also whether there was some deviant case analysis, if you will, of those teachers who never got with the program, you know, mm -hmm. who never you know, bought uh, the, the whole program just waited patiently until all that went away in a few years and there was a whole new yeah. band that came, that came uh, racing in or had given up entirely and, and were just putting in their time and finishing up until they checked out and somebody else would have that problem afterwards and so on. So I'm interested in both the exemplars, the good news to come out of it, but also whether your analysis so far or in the future could help to identify some of those sort of bad examples of where it goes awry yeah. and where something else needs to be thought about. I, I think with, with this study, I think the, the, the examples that would be most likely to be more vivid and more helpful to practitioners would be examples that would grow out of the qualitative data. That, sure. the, 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 the results from the qualitative data are a little bit more slow to trickle out in this study than, right. than with the quantitative. Uh, data, but I think yeah, we have we were in 12 schools where we have and and and, and, and we've actually done a couple studies where we've actually done some mixed method studies where we're able to sort of place cases on these quantitative continua and and and, and look at cases like this. But yeah, no, I think that's a. I'll, um, I'll be very interested as those trickle out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Rich. Yeah, I have a question about the 
I always like the CSR model because it really focused on design. And design, like you said, I think really well, that design gives you goals and it gives you roles to get to those goals. And so it's, it's really a nice way to think about change. The problem I always had with CSR is it, it seemed to be along the lines of the infantilization of schools. Like the designers were not in the schools. The designers were outside the schools and the schools received the wisdom and then they complied with the wisdom. And then the fidelity of the model was determined by the degree to which the school surrendered its own autonomy and embraced the model, right? And so there's this very sort of, the, the, the knowledge is on the outside and the inside is passive and it's a receiver of the, it's just, it's all free. <laughs> so, but the last sentence here I think is really good. In previous research, we found that even the most prescriptive interventions were substantially modified and adapted by teachers and leaders. Did you find any relation between the degree of deviation from the plan and the influence on student learning? Mm. Um, yeah, and, and I, I think our evidence would actually point to the opposite. I think our evidence would point to the, the more that, for example, in SFA, the more that teachers stuck to the plan, despite you know, folks' complaints about how prescriptive SFA is and, and how much it usurps professional autonomy. In that particular intervention, the more that schools and teachers stuck to the plan, the greater effect that it had. Yep. <laughs> so what about, one, one follow-up thing, so what about the art teachers? About the music teachers, do you have any data on the non-literacy teachers and whether they, whether their either perceptions of the program or their their perceived influences on students went up or down? Yeah, not really good data. No, we we focused. Um, that's one of the um, trade-offs, I guess you'd say, that we that we made the the program focused, uh, or the, the study rather, focused on literacy and math. We, the, the math really, interestingly enough, doesn't get a, a, a tremendous amount of attention, even though it was, you know, fully sort of half the study's focus was to focus on math. And, and um, but these intervention programs were not, uh, you know, like a lot of programs around the country at the time, weren't focusing that heavily on math. They were focusing on literacy. And um, so we didn't, yeah, we didn't do a great job. It, um, at, at sort of looking beyond um, teachers within the school that were focusing on those two subject areas. Yeah. Julie. Mine is a very simple, mm -hmm. given the philosophical question you just answered. But um, I'm just curious about um, your, your discussion of the, the teachers' leaders. And uh, you mentioned in the vignettes that you have here that a, a teacher was named to be the design coach or whatever. So I'm curious whether the teacher leaders were assigned by um, a reallocation of existing resources mm -hmm. or whether mm -hmm. teacher leaders were um, a new resource that was provided to the schools that took place. Yeah, mostly the former. It's, and it's, um, and it's, it's, it's kind of a curious, because there are, there, you can imagine a range of different personnel policies. And, and, um, and so it was mostly the former. The, the, it, it, <coughs> typically, teachers in the, in the school who were already there were, um, were named to these positions. I did, um, I did a little uh, paper where I looked at uh, the, one of the consequences um, and it was just one of those kind of, you know, trying to stir things up a little bit. But, you know, one of the consequences that you're taking in these kind of low capacity disadvantaged settings, you're taking the best and brightest teachers potentially. If you're, if you're following these models as they were designed, you're <coughs> taking some of the best and brightest teachers and allocating, you're taking them out of the classroom and you're allocating them to teacher leadership positions. So I think that that's, you know, that practice, right, is not, is not un unproblematic, but I th yeah, that's that's what they did by and large. But there, I think there were some in some cases they did have this model where um, there were uh, you'd have a shared leader maybe across multiple schools. But by and large, these were in school leaders who were there before the program. But if they were started. released from mm -hmm. their some of their other responsibilities and were doing this in the sense that it's an infusion of additional resources. 
and somebody else is doing what they would have been doing if they were still full-time teachers. Yeah, absolutely, so yeah. So that had to come from someplace. It could yeah. come from that school or from the district or from outside funding. Did they right. hire other teachers to take their place, or did they just reallocate so that actually teacher-people ratios went up because they had freed somebody up to... A little, a little bit of both. Some of these teacher leaders had kind of joint appointments, if you will. So they had, they were still spending some time in the classroom, but then had some release time to 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 do this leadership. But yeah, in other cases, they actually hired another teacher to replace that resource. Along those lines, a little bit. Can you talk about how were those leaders then trained? Was there a specific training that came along with these programs and their history? Yeah. Yeah. In all three of the models, they, um, there was um, some degree of a, a kind of a, a train the trainer in that um, there, was some, there was some training provided to a local school team from the, the, the central program. And then that team was then responsible for um, training teachers. Um, but all of the, in all three of the programs, the leaders themselves, and in most cases the principals too, there was kind of a training component for the principals. But in all three of the programs, there was, um, there was a pretty substantial training component for the leader. So they received training, by and large, from the central, the, 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 the comprehensive program itself. In some cases, if there was sort of a regional um, if, if, if there was a, a kind of a, 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 a if the if there was a lot of schools within a particular region that were implementing um, uh, the program, they, there might, the training might have come from a, a local school or a local district. But by and large, it came from um, the program itself. Did, did that answer answer your question? Yeah. 